Hi everyone. Today, I'm going to share my recent experience aboard the P&O Avia on a Mediterranean cruise. Now, I've got to be honest, there were some highs and lows on this trip, and I want to give you all a fair and balanced review. So, if you're considering booking a trip on the Avia, stay tuned, because you'll want to hear this. Let's start with one of the best parts of any cruise, the ports of call. My Mediterranean journey took us to some incredible destinations. First up was La Coruna, where I explored the beautiful old town and visited the Tower of Hercules, a must do if you visit La Coruna. La Coruna is easy to get around as the ship docks right in the heart of the city. The coastal views were absolutely stunning and a perfect way to kick off the trip. In Mallorca, I opted for a beach day in Palma Nova. If you're looking for a relaxed day soaking up the sun, this is the perfect spot. The beach was beautiful, with soft sand and crystal clear water. It was a great change of pace from all the sightseeing. You can also get the shuttle bus from the ship to Palma. It stops near the cathedral. Next, we visited La Spezia, which I used as a gateway to Florence. Florence was everything you'd imagine rich in history, art, and of course, amazing food. It's easy to navigate and wander the cobblestone streets. The Duomo was certainly a highlight. As well, Florence's Old Bridge, or the Pont Vecchio in Italian, is a medieval, pedestrianized bridge at the southern edge of the city's historical hub. It is one of Florence's most photographed sites. It was a packed day, but totally worth it. Other options from La Spezia include a visit to Cinque Terre. Barcelona was another highlight. There's just so much to see and do. I hit the must-see spot of La Sagrada Familia. But honestly, just wandering around and taking in the atmosphere was a joy, including wandering down Las Ramblas and visiting the La Boqueria market. But be careful as I was warned before visiting several times about pickpockets in Barcelona. The city's vibrant energy is contagious. I stayed on board instead of getting off in Marseille and made the most of Avia being quieter and got an infinity pool to myself. However, there is a shuttle bus that will drop you off and several people I spoke to said that they enjoyed Marseille. I had heard mixed reviews previously. Have you been? Let me know in the comments if you think it's a good port of call. Cadiz offered a mix of history and charm. The old town is picturesque with its narrow streets and lovely squares. The old port is gorgeous and I had an amazing time exploring the nearby neighborhoods with their mix of cultures and flavors. It's a bustling city with a lot to offer. Each of these stops brought something unique to the table and they were definitely the highlights of the cruise. Now, let's talk about those seven days at sea. Personally, I loved having so much time to just unwind and enjoy the ship. There's something incredibly peaceful about being out on the open water with nothing but the horizon in sight. It gave me time to read, relax, and really disconnect from the usual hustle and bustle. That being said, I know seven sea days might not be for everyone. If you're someone who craves constant activity or new experiences every day, it could start to feel a bit monotonous but for me, it was a perfect way to recharge. Let's start with one of the biggest challenges I faced, finding a sunbed on a sea day. Now, I've been on plenty of cruises, but this was something else. The ship was absolutely packed, with over 6,000 on board, and securing a sunbed felt like a competitive sport. By 8 am, most of them were already reserved with towels, even though no one was actually using them. And let me tell you, the search didn't get any easier as the day went on. It was frustrating, to say the least, and definitely not the relaxing experience you'd hope for on holiday. P&O really needs to sort this out, maybe by enforcing their no-reserving policy more strictly, or adding more sunbeds where possible. Otherwise, it's just a scramble, and you have no chance of finding a sunbed by a pool unless you get up early. The pools themselves on a sea day were also too small for the number of people on board. If you don't mind not having a sunbed, then there are seats available, but not necessary near the pools. I needed to head to the sunset bar at the back of Decade. Great views and comfy chairs, 
Another issue I encountered was the lack of staff. The ship felt seriously understaffed, especially in the bars and dining areas. On more than one occasion, I was left waiting far too long for service, and it seemed the crew were run off their feet. I know this isn't the staff's fault they were doing their best, but it's something P&O needs to address to keep up with passenger expectations. When you're on holiday, the last thing you want is to feel like you're waiting ages for a drink or a meal. So this was a bit of a letdown. One of the major downsides was just how full the ship was. It often felt overcrowded, especially during peak times. Getting from one place to another could be a bit of a challenge with the sheer number of people on board. The elevators were often packed, and navigating through the ship sometimes felt more like a chore than a leisurely stroll. This overcrowding definitely took away from the overall experience. And speaking of crowds, the main dining areas and buffets were often overwhelmed, which leads me to my next point. Now, let's talk about the food in the main dining room and buffet. I have to say, the quality seems to have gone downhill compared to previous P&O cruises I've been on. The menu options were limited, and the dishes themselves often lack the flavour and presentation I've come to expect. The buffet was a bit hit or miss too, with some items tasting a bit bland or overcooked. It's disappointing, especially when you know how good it can be. That said, there were still some decent meals, but overall, it didn't quite hit the mark this time around. Now, if you're like me and love a good swim or soak in the hot tub, you'll want to know when's the best time to enjoy the pools. With the ship being so full, the pools and hot tubs were often busy, especially during the afternoons. But I found that early mornings and late evenings were the best times to have a quieter, more relaxing experience. If you're up for an early start, you can have the pool almost to yourself, and it's a great way to kick off the day. Alternatively, after dinner, when most people are at the shows or winding down, the pools and hot tubs are a lot less crowded, but it's not all doom and gloom. There were definitely some food highlights, starting with the keys. This casual dining area was fantastic, great variety, and the food here was consistently good. It was a breath of fresh air compared to the main dining room. Sindhu was another standout. The Indian cuisine here was absolutely delicious, with rich flavours and a great atmosphere. And let's not forget about Sixth Street. This is a great addition to Avia. But book early to avoid disappointment, as this was one of the restaurants that proved the most popular. So, would I recommend the P&O Avia? It's a bit of a mixed bag. If you're looking for a lively atmosphere with some great dining options like the Keys, Sindhu and 6th Street, you'll find it here. The ports of call were absolutely fantastic, offering a mix of culture, relaxation and adventure. And for those who love sea days, there's plenty of time to unwind. But if you're after a more relaxing cruise experience, the overcrowding, service issues and declining food quality in the main dining room might put a damper on things. P&O has some work to do to bring the Avia up to par with its other ships, but there's still potential here. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you found this review helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more travel content. Have you been on the Avia or planning a cruise soon? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, happy cruising.